Hi, and welcome back to the Global Networking Show, whether it's uh, afternoon for you here in the UK, whether it's evening in Hong Kong and China, or whether it's the morning in the United States or wherever you may be. You know, when uh, most people hear the word networking, their thoughts immediately spring to a vision of a room full of strangers uh, plucking up the courage to introduce themselves to each other and exchanging business cards and elevator pitches. Events play a major role in networking, but they can be much more productive than just that. We've been joined today by two absolute experts on the subject. We welcome back for the first time a, a guest from a previous show, and that's Susan Rowan, who really is... Uh, I don't know how to put this the best possible way, Susan, but Susan <laughs> was one of the founding thinkers on networking skills and networking events. She, she authored the book, How to Work a Room, 25 years ago, uh, and has just brought out the new edition. So welcome back, Susan. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, My and, pleasure. And we're also joined by Skype for the moment. We're hoping to get him onto the Google Hangout um, by Stanley Kong. Stanley is uh, the executive director for BNI in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen, and in Guangzhou. And I hope I pronounced all of those correctly, Stanley. Absolutely <laughs> yeah, correct. Cool. Thank you. We're also joined here today by uh, Inga Dexney, who will be letting us know if you have any questions for our guests. Andy? Well, Inga, can you just uh, let everyone know how they can get involved with the show, please? Sure. If you are watching us live, please join the show by sending us your questions. Or you can tweet us using the hashtag GNATshow or post your questions on YouTube or Google Hangouts. Great, thank you. And please do get involved and, and, and ask us some questions through the show. But in the meantime, Ivan and I have lots of things to ask uh, our guests, so plenty, plenty of topics for conversation. Um, so, Susan, I'd like to start with you, if, if I may do. Um, the biggest problem for most people when they when they go to any networking event comes right at the beginning. And, and I've heard so many stories about people who have told me that they've actually got to the door of an event and, and turn, almost turned away again as soon as they saw everyone in there networking away. In fact, one, uh, one man told me that he, he got to the door of an event, mm -hmm. he looked in, he went back outside, he phoned his wife, said, I can't do this. And she said, well, you better do, because there's no point coming back here for breakfast. I'm not making it for you. <laughs> uh, and I've heard those types of stories plenty of times. So, you know, this comes from that fear of approaching strangers that, you know, we all face it to one degree or another. So let's start with some simple advice for people about how you overcome that fear and get into that networking event in the first place. Well, first of all, I define it a little differently. Um, having written two different books, one on how to work a room, which is about mingling and socializing and circulating, and the other one on the secrets of savvy networking. To me, the mingling and the working a room is one skill, and the ability to be a great networker, which involves so much follow-up, yeah. is a different skill. And some people are great at networking. They do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. But like your friend whose wife won't cook him breakfast, and I love that story, the idea of walking into a room full of strangers is daunting. And to let all our Google hanger outers know, statistically according to social science research, about 90% of adults feel uncomfortable walking into a room full of people they don't know. So number one, you are normal. Number two, how we get over that is we prepare. We know we're going to an event. And I'm sorry to say, as much as I love the word networking and working a room, all of a sudden walking into a room full of people, we've given it an assignment and made it work. Well, that can turn your stomach if you haven't had breakfast yet or any other time of the day. So it's all about preparation. Know where you're going. Now because of Google and, and Bing, you should never go anywhere where you don't know who's there. Look people up. Look up the event. Plan your self-introduction. Uh, take a deep breath, and when you walk in the room, remember all that you've read online and in your newspapers, and you'll have a lot of conversation to make if you observe what people are wearing and doing. And just approach them, because remember this, 90% of them self-identify as shy. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, just to pick up on, on one of the key things you said there, there was a lot there that I think is very relevant. Um, one of the key things is people think about it as work, and I, I had a, uh, a catch up with a client during the week and I had advised him on an approach to a conference he went to and one of the key things I said was enjoy yourself and he's come away with a host of contacts and he said before that I would have gone and it would have been um, it would have been work even though it was in Cannes and the sun was shining I would have found it a chore but I was oh, able wow. to relax and enjoy it and that made a huge difference Stanley, what what advice do you give people who come along to say, for example, for you, to your BNI breakfast for the first time and are visibly shaking? You know, how do you relax them and make them feel comfortable? I, I think um, when uh, one of the thing is very important is to do your homework and find somebody. Let's say is an influencer or you to, you introducer that set up the bridge with the strangers, just like if. The friend invite you to a BNI meeting. He's your bitch, so <laughs> can set yeah. up. You can immediately build a rapport with the stranger by his or her introductions. I think it's very important. And yeah. also, yeah. Now carry on, please. Okay, and uh, do do the homework. I mean that uh, you need to know what your audience or what are the people in the room. For example, are they uh, tra transactional based or relational based? What are the topics of the networking event? Uh, will you do some um, research on the internet before you go to the event? I think it's very important to have enough information ahead. Okay, so, so echoing very much what, what Susan uh, was saying about the, the importance of preparation as well and, and knowing what you're going in there for. So I have a question for, for Susan. Uh, Susan, uh, you, you talk about, you differentiate between working a room in a more social setting versus networking and that they're different. So maybe, would you mind talking a little bit about how you would um, open a conversation in one setting versus the other setting? Would you make it a different conversation? You know what, Ivan, when I think about it, I would have to say no. You're still approaching people. You still have to, first of all, at every even business event, it's a social setting. You have a beverage in your hand. It might be coffee. It might be something a tad stronger. You might have a croissant or an hors d'oeuvre in the other. So really, when you're standing around at an event and there's, quote, an opportunity to mingle, it's still people. My best advice is if you approach people as people, and this is what I say, it's one of my rules, don't treat people as prospects. And Ivan, you and I have talked about it. If you approach people as prospects, it's almost a natural turn off. Treat people like people. I like to say treat people like they're part of the group of people you already know. Um, it's noticing something they're wearing. It's noticing something that, you know, where they might be standing. Um, you know, at an, an evening event where there are hors d'oeuvres, I always tell people, you know, stand at the best hors d'oeuvres. I mean, talk to people about food. It's that small talk. So I think it's about remembering that people are people, whether it's a very important business event, because that's what's going to make them comfortable. And I'm going to turn that around and jump on something Stanley said, which is so great, about people who introduce people. Make it your job to make people comfortable with you. You be that introducer. Even if you don't know people, you could say, oh, hey, Ivan, have you met Andy? Pick up mm -hmm. something. And if you do that, you're the matchmaker. And you help people meet each other and expand their network. So I'm, I'm all about treat people like people, be fun, be nice to them, make them feel comfortable, business or social. I think you'll do more business at business events if you remember that they're just really people who want to feel comfortable. Good advice. I, I, and I, I think that we've probably got, for me, the most important piece of advice for anyone going to a networking event there because you said don't treat the people as prospects and that's the biggest mistake people make is they go into a room full of people who are not there to uh, who are not there to buy they're there to sell themselves and we go up and we try and pitch them we try and sell to them uh, and you you 
there's, there's no wonder people feel uncomfortable at networking events when all we're doing is getting into what I call a networking dance, which is an exchange of elevator pitches where no one's really interested. And, and you know, the, the advice I give is to sell through the room rather than to the room. And if you can take that mindset in and focus on finding people you like, finding people you have a rapport with, finding people you can build a relationship with, then you'll find, okay, maybe people will buy from you if it's appropriate. But actually, over time, they may give you levels of support and referrals, introductions, uh, feedback, ideas that are far in excess of any value of, of any any purchases they might make. May I say I, I agree with both what you're saying and, and Susan what you're saying. Um, but let's let's look at the um, sort of the the opposite end of the spectrum that I hear all the time, which is, hey, you're there, you're talking to somebody, it's a great opportunity. And here's the phrase I always hear, and I can tell you how I feel about it, but I'd like to hear how you feel about it. They say, hey, it never hurts to ask, right? Do you agree? Does it ever hurt to ask? Depends what you're asking for, Ivan. For business. Hey, you know what? Uh, you could use my product. You could use my service. Or maybe you could introduce me to this person I know you know who will introduce me to your product or service. Now, I have a strong opinion on this, but I'd like to hear yours. Is there a right or wrong answer, Ivan? <laughs> um, yeah, I think. You know, you, I, I'll I, tell you. Listen, I'll tell you what my. Um, I think you. Yes, it it, it absolutely uh, it is. Uh, it hurts to ask if there's no relationship. Absolutely, bingo. What, what I see all the time is people meet someone. Susan, hi, my name's Ivan. It's really great to meet you. You know, I know you know so and so. Would you mind introducing me to them? And and I this happens to me so much. And I keep thinking, okay, I'm sorry, I am Ivan. What was your name again? Who are you? And you want me to introduce you to this person? I don't even know you. So this whole idea of it never hurts to ask is completely wrong in my opinion. No, I agree. I think that it never hurts to ask when you have a relationship, when there's a connection. I agree with that. Boy, the way you said it just sounded like my grandmother, Ivan, by the way. But I say that too. It never hurts to ask. But when you have a relationship that merits it, the other piece of it is you can't ask people for things that are outside their circumference. Boy, did I remember that from geometry. Geometry, But it's all about relationship, which you and you, Andy, Ivan, and Stanley, I know we all believe in, is that you build relationships with people. I tell people if you, and I do this myself, if you go to have a good time, and how about this, this is going to sound so Pollyanna-ish, if you go places to make friends instead of connections, I think you build those relationships. But Ivan, you correct me if I'm wrong, relationships are built over time not over a beverage at a two-hour event. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's all about uh, moving through that uh, time confidence curve that uh, exists when you're talking about referral business. And Stanley, there's, there's a, a different etiquette, uh, I think, in, in the West where we're much more relaxed with the way we interact with people uh, than there is in, in particularly Southeast Asia where you are, where there's you know, much much more rigid rules about the way you you introduce yourself, you present business cards, you receive them. So, if in an event in in say in, in China, in Hong Kong, someone turns around to someone they've never met before and immediately asks them for business or, or asks them for a key connection, how would that be received? How would people respond in the moment, and how, and how would they respond, I guess, internally as well? I think you would be very rude. Yeah, yeah, in um, Hong Kong or in China, uh, 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 these places, because I think uh, uh, in Asian culture, I think they are more into the building a long-term relationship, trust, and they will uh, take a very clear look into your background, how, uh, to see how you do, how you honor your promises. So. Uh, if you uh, are to hunting uh, in um, the networking event, I think it's very bad for your credibility. And that's something we can learn from because I think that where you look at where those structures are more firmly in place, there's a reason for it. And 
while I, I, I think there are benefits as well to the more relaxed approach uh, in the West as well, we can learn from the fact that, well, it's rude for a reason. And exactly what Ivan said, you know, I don't know you yet. Why would I yeah. help you without trusting you? And what, what value of connection could I really give you if I've never met you before? Yeah, because in um, Asia, Asia countries, I think uh, because of the, uh, the culture, I think seniority is very um, mm. emphasized in, I think, in many business events or business occasions. Some, somehow people would like to meet up the uh, celebrities or, or the uh, senior people in the room, but you need to be very careful. For example, in Asia, I think people treat their physical space very uh, seriously. The physical distance, I mean, uh, people to people, I think is much more farther than what we uh, saw in uh, Western culture. They are more serious, more tied up. And for example, uh, let me give you an example. For example, the business card, we need to uh, uh, have the business card in both hands yeah. in order to give to another people. Not like the Western. The Western can be very casual. Yeah, when I saw in different occasions in US or in uh, other places in Western world. Yeah. And it's interesting, I'm seeing more and more people in the West now hand over business cards with two hands and receive them with two hands. So it's starting, I mean, I'm talking about still a small percentage of the people I meet at events, but the mm -hmm. number is definitely increasing. So it'll be interesting to see how much of that etiquette starts to seep into the way we do business elsewhere, the way we network elsewhere. I mean, Su Susan, in 25 years since you first wrote the book, how much has that etiquette changed? Oh, that etiquette has changed, but one of the things that um, I noticed and that I didn't write in 25 years ago, but I certainly have in this silver anniversary issue, is that we must borrow from the East because what I find is um, in the West we would take a card and shove it in the pocket, and I always said, please borrow from the East, look at the card, show it what I think is the bottom line in all of this respect. Look at the card. By the way, there's a reason for that too. When you look at the card, you see the person's name, what they do. It helps your memory. And if you show some honor and respect to the card, you can even build some conversation off of the card, but you don't just throw it in your pocket. So I think that borrowing from the Eastern culture, and I think to what Stanley said, respecting seniority, respecting people's positions is still important in the West. You really do have to comport yourself with etiquette and um, and manners. I have a, a chapter in there called, you know, you know, manners, etiquette and manners. They're really two very, they're different because you could know all the rules of etiquette and still have an officious manner that's really off-putting. Mm -hmm. But if you have a manner that's friendly and open, what you do with etiquette and knowing the proper is important and you do have to show deference still here and you should know when but it's called doing your homework and preparing. Before we move on to the next question, uh, Inga, have we got any questions from the audience and can you just remind people how they can get involved with the show? Sure, uh, we don't have questions yet, we have a comment from Terry Brock who says, what a great panel. Thank you to all your wonderful people for sharing. Susan Ryan, you are fabulous and have a lot of great information. Thanks. And you yes. got the payroll. <laughs> Been on the show. So you can tweet us using the hashtag uh, GNETSHOW or you can put your questions uh, on YouTube or on Google Hangouts. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Inga. Can I pick up now on one of my biggest bugbears when it comes to networking and, and it picks up on, on what we've just been talking about in terms of those exchanges and it will be interesting to get the different takes because I think my approach might be a bit controversial but the, the what I would call the dreaded elevator pitch. The, the first thing everyone's taught about going to a networking event and someone said it on a Someone asked my advice on a Facebook chat last week and someone came in and said get your elevator pitch ready. You know, and, and my, my advice is always leave your elevator pitch on the ground floor. So um, 
Susan, perhaps we can start with you. Perhaps you can explain to people who don't know what on earth I'm talking about what an elevator pitch is, and then give us your advice. And then Stanley, uh, let us know, you know, your your take on that as well. So Susan. Well, what I have written in I don't know how many books and said it is your elevator pitch, and pardon me for the baseball uh, reference, must be pitched. Don't do it. It's it's usually off-putting. And if you're in an elevator with someone and you're pitching your stuff, really, I'm sure they'll get off at the next floor. You should know how to introduce yourself. And that's not a 15, 30 second introduction. That's a whole lot of time about you. What I advise is at every event you have so that you're prepared a seven to nine second pleasantry of how you introduce yourself. And you help people by telling them maybe how you happen to be at that event, which gives them context for, you know, I'm here because, you know, I'm an interest I'm interested, whatever, but if it's social, you know, I you know, I'm the bride's mother, that might help. But give people context. But I'm so opposed to elevator pitches. If you're standing at a, an event that says we want you to give your elevator pitch, that's one thing, but not with a beverage in one hand and an hors d'oeuvre in another. It's off-putting. So that's just my personal opinion, and I agree with you, Andy. Or if someone says, so tell me what you do, then you want to be prepared for, and I, don't, I just don't like the term elevator pitch, but you need to be prepared to be able to explain what you do uh, effectively. I think the first thing you should say to somebody when you meet them for the first time is uh, is to ask them questions. You know, be interested more than interesting. And, um, and 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 before you do any kind of or think of any kind of elevator pitch, get that other person to open up and talk a little bit. First of all, it enables you, if nothing else, to have more information about them, so that when you do talk to them about about what you do, you can position it in a way that makes more sense to them or is more relevant um, to them. And, and I want to challenge you on that in a second, Ivan. Um, oh, I'd love to. I just did a blog on this topic today. So. Excellent, excellent. But Stanley, what, what, what are your views on this? Uh, uh, I both agree with Ivan and Susan. I think asking a question is a very powerful way to establish, establishing trust. You know, I used to be a reporter a <laughs> very long time ago. Ah. I, know the <laughs> I know the power of asking the right questions. So if you ask the question you mean, you control the, the, the whole conversation, you control the power. So, and also you make you make uh, uh, the one feel you are interested in them, not only interested in selling your own story uh, to other people. So don't misunderstood to sell in an elevator, to get try, try to collect check from the elevator, you can you no self can be done in an elevator. <laughs> I don't think so. I think you should. Uh, there's a story I, I would like to share. Yes, my friend, uh, she she is an insurance agent. When she uh, is uh, in a event with a Westerner, she just you seven to ten seconds to introduce herself to to. To, to this guy. And the one who was very interested and, and, and my friend asked, are you interested in, in tell, tell, uh, having more information about me? So she gave her uh, him another 20 seconds. And then finally she got uh, to make an appointment with him. And after that she made the first uh, I insurance uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, this CEO. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. And and there will be occasions where that happens, where you get the right person who's in buying mode, but you you still have the occasion I was talking about. The, the, the general scenario at most networking events is most people go there to sell, not to buy, which to yeah. me is just the the worst place in the world to try and sell something because people aren't in buying mode. You um, can stumble. You can stumble over business. Even a blind oh, yeah. squirrel. Even a blind squirrel can find a nut. So it, it's. <laughs> And it, it's a, it, it's yeah. actually about the the you know the the what's going to work in the long term, uh, yeah. which is more important. Now, in I think the questioning is key, and obviously your background as a journalist will help you with that. 
Um, the danger with that is that there are people that go in with a list of questions I need to ask at networking events who will ask for those. And if you if you ask those, you sound like someone who's got a list yeah. of questions to ask at a networking event. You, you yeah. your question it's a discussion, not an interrogation. Exactly, and and, and they, need, they they need to be based on what the other person's just said. It's called a conversation, yeah. right. uh, not an interrogation. And, and I think so. Go in with your opening question, but then respond, which is key. But Ivan, this is where I, I'll differ with what you said, and it'd be okay. interesting to get your take. You said that when someone asks you what you do. You need an answer, and actually, this is where I might get controversial. I don't necessarily agree because I think that when people say, "What do you do at a networking event?" Generally, that that's what I call the networking equivalent of "Do you come here often?" And it's, <laughs> it's the same question all over the world, and and people don't actually care, um, and it's an icebreaker. And, and I realized this a few a few years ago when I was at two events in a short period of time. And at the first one. I went through the networking dance where I said to someone, what do you do? And he gave me his elevator pitch. Now, that was the first half of the dance. All the time he was giving me his elevator pitch, of course, I'm standing there thinking, that's nice. When are you going to finish? Because when you finish, you'll ask me, what do I do? And I can give you my elevator pitch. And after all, isn't that why we're all here? But he didn't. He just finished his elevator pitch, said it's good to meet you, shook my hand and walked away. And after initially cursing him, I actually thought, well, thank you, because you saved me a minute of my life that I would have wasted. <laughs> but, you know, I, I asked him, what do you do? And it was just, well, what do you do? That's the icebreaker. The expression is neutral. A couple of months later, I was speaking at an event in Scotland, and, and someone I had met a few times through my network, but at social events in London, came across from Edinburgh to meet me. And we sat down for a coffee, and she said, Andy, what do you actually do? And that's when the penny dropped. I want to answer that question when people care what the answer is. Until then, I'd rather change the subject and focus on building the relationship because they may not ask again for fear of looking foolish. Sorry? You said you had a question there for me. <laughs> Turned into a diatribe. So no, no I, I said I disagree with you on that on that topic because I feel that actually you can turn that question around into a relationship building exercise rather than necessarily answering the question in the moment. Well, that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to understand your audience. And so by asking the person uh, first some questions about themselves, maybe personally, not just professionally. Um, you know, as Susan talked about, have a conversation with them as an individual, not just as another business person. And as you get to know them a little bit, then you know better how to respond. Now, the the, the article that I made reference um, to uh, that, that got published uh, actually went out of my newsletter today. Was give me one good reason I should do business with you, and it was actually based on a. a I don't know if you do you have the TV show the Shark Tank in um, in, in the UK. I've heard of it, but I've never seen it, so we may it's, do. I, I love that show, and I've become totally addicted to that show. I love it, and I was watching a, a, a rerun, um, and um, somebody asked her that very question, why should we do business with you? And she knew her audience. She knew her audience. She had gone in there to pitch them, and they asked her what she should do, and her answer um, had nothing to do with her audience. And that's the point I'm making, is that if you know the person that you're talking to a little bit, then you know how to respond better. Her answer was, because they're going to potentially invest in her business, her answer was, well, when they said, why should we do business with you? She said, well, I have two wonderful little children, and it's, you know, it's really important for me as a mother to be blah, 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 <laughs> right? That was her answer. And they're sitting there going... Really? And luckily, luckily, one of the sharks said something they never do. Uh, he said, uh, okay, you need a do-over. We asked you a very specific question, and you didn't answer that question at all. Um, and, oh, by the way, I paused at that moment, and I said to my wife, she just completely lost it. She blew any opportunity. Yeah. And Beth said she didn't respond to her audience. She gave a relational answer answer to transactional sharks. So if you know that who, a little bit about the person you're dealing with, you know better how to respond. By the way, somebody gave her a do-over, and her do-over was, you should do business with me because I have uh, a pending order worth $2 million, and I can't fill it. So it sounds, it sounds like 
what you what you're describing is what we we uh, show we have called Dragon's Den. I, I guess Shark yeah. Tank. Is the Very similar. Equivalent to that. Um, and yeah, you're right. But that's a different environment. That's not the networking event that we're talking about here. And no, but it, but the same thing applies. You still have to get to uh, my. My suggestion is that you ask questions that you get to know them a little bit so that when they ask you about yourself, you know which direction to go. It's really about understanding behavioral styles as well as, as, well as context of discussion. Yeah, and picking up Susan's point, it's the follow-up. You know, that, I want to get to that question after we've met several times. You, you, you know, sometimes, and it's worked with me, there are exceptions to the rule. I, I've been asked that question, I've answered it and got business from it. Because I've been with a transactional person, yeah. but you have to be able to recognize that early on. Um, but I just want to give you a question that we could give to everyone who's hanging out with us. Instead of asking someone who you just met, oh, what do you do? What I often will say is, oh, what brought you here? Yeah. And then they can say, well, I'm here because blah, blah, blah. And then you have a, a conversation that started. It's... Uh, and maybe I'm more indirect and more female in my conversation, but I my goal is to help people open up, and when they open up, then I can find the context and find that little nugget that we might have in common. So what brought you here is a good general opener. You, you bring up a good point, and in our gender study that was part of the, the gender book, of Business Networking and Sex, we found that women tended to ask that question much more than men. What brought you here? Or how did you hear about tonight's event? Very common uh, um, question from women. And we recommended that men start using that, particularly men who tend to be very transactional, because it's a great way to open up a conversation, particularly with women, um, because women use it with women. And, and they use it with men as well, but they use it a lot with women. And it's a very relational approach to networking versus that transactional approach. It's a great point that you just brought up. Stanley, how do you uh, advise people to open conversations? If not, with what do you do? Um, sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, I think you can uh, easily tell. Or maybe and other question is, uh, who introduced you to this event? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, or maybe uh, uh, in Hong Kong sometimes, uh, oh. Uh, we said, okay, uh, uh, why are you interested in coming to this event? That will be, uh, I think, a good opener for, 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 for many people. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it, they all come under the same banner, which is, do you come here often? You're looking for something you've got in common, and that's the event you're at. So yes. who do you know here? Who brought you here? What did you think of the speakers? Have you been before? Are all good uh, openers. Inga, I think we have... Uh, a comment or a question. Yes. Uh, so Sue commented that she agree about the problems with elevator pitch and she thinks that it happens because people need to learn what they do to help them. Um, the question, what do you do? Um, this is one of the comments. And then uh, we have a question from Terry to all of you. And he is saying that uh, he has a terrible problem on how to politely excuse himself from the person at an event who is obnoxiously always talking about themselves. Um, he doesn't want to be rude, but what is a good and polite uh, uh, way to extricate yourself from, from that? Um, it's all about me person um, you encounter. Um, so this is a question to all of you. And even oh. to widen that out, even if you're in a conversation with someone you'd like, how do you get out of that as well? I think that's the most common question I get asked. How do I get out of conversations? So Stanley, what would you, your advice be? I think if, uh, uh, I would like to uh, further connect with these people, I will uh, set an appointment of, uh, 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 with him or her way away. Yeah, I think it's, in Eastern culture, I think it's a very good way of follow up. Maybe uh, arrange a lunch or dinner appointment is very common in uh, our culture. I think it's a good idea. 
for someone you would like to get out and and not to, uh, want to follow up further, you may excuse your, uh, yourself, but uh, you need to uh, uh, connect with another people. I think people will understand. Yeah, you just uh, say it lightly. I think yeah. people will understand. They try to connect. Or co uh, uh, someone would try to uh, uh, see another one, but they are, they are shy to, to say it out. So be the first one to to to, to say it. So be honest. You know, too, yes. many, too many people going to the toilet or, for, or to the bar rather oh. than being honest to me. <laughs> yeah. I just tweeted. I, I, uh, excuse me, sir. I just tweeted my blog uh, three ways to extricate graciously. Uh, so let me give you the tip for Terry when you are with the awful person that you really, you know, you're already like sweating, but it's blood coming out of your forehead. So here's what you do. You have to still be polite because that person, you never know. That's my overall theme for whatever room. You never know who you're talking to. You might know that person, but you don't know who they're related to, who they know, who's in their network. And they may have had something happen that day that has totally thrown them off. That's it. And, and so here's what you do. You just put out, in this Western culture, you put out your hand. You don't say it was wonderful to meet you because that's a lie. But what you say is, with a big smile and politely, oh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event, whatever it is. And then you move a quarter of the room way to another, another group. But you're still polite. Um, being able to extricate is very important. Um, I have a friend who's wonderful, she'll tell you in background, in which she says, I could monopolize your time all night, but I know you need to meet other people, and I bet they want to meet you. But it's natural for her to say it. I haven't been able to pull that off myself. Now, I think you're, you're shaking their hand, and uh, uh, I have no problem saying it was nice to meet you. I mean, it, people I've met that uh, I wasn't particularly... Uh, impressed with it's still nice meeting them I love meeting people I have no problem shaking their hand saying it was very nice meeting you and uh, extricating myself I've never had that backfire in any way I, I people just they don't know how to do it and they apologize hey look I'm really sorry and you can move around don't apologize say hey you know it was really nice uh, meeting you thank you very much shake your hand it, it really can be that the, the, the best way if it's appropriate and, and maybe for Terry's example people won't thank you for this so, so use it wisely but is to introduce people to someone else at the event someone who's relevant to them because what will happen is you know, I've found it time again, particularly if you can find a reason to introduce them, you, you say you two should meet, they'll ignore you pretty quickly and you can move on quite happily. But you're 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 placing them into another conversation. Or taking the two approaches together, you take um, someone you've had a good conversation with and say, Look, you know, I could talk to you all evening, but we really should meet some more people. Why don't we join you know, that person over there is on their own or that those two guys there look like they're open to conversation. Join another conversation, and it will start splitting different ways. And that, to me, is if you can do it effectively with the right reasons, then that's the, the most powerful way to, to move on from the conversation. I agree. That's actually the third one. We call that the bring-along. Because what you're also doing is it's not just that you're extricating. You're helping another person build their network and their contacts. And, that's, and it's, by the way, besides that, it's gracious and it's inclusive and I think that that's the one that gets you remembered the most. And, and you're being, Stanley talked at the very beginning of the show about being a bridge and that's exactly what you're doing. Well, we're running out of time, um, probably enough time for uh, one more comment, uh, closing comment or question, I don't know Inga if we have any last question. Uh, at the moment I can't see, uh, it seems there is no question. I do apologize to Sue because I didn't see um, all your comment. Maybe I can read it out yeah, sure. uh, regarding um, elevator pitch. Please Sue, please. Yeah. So um, Sue is saying uh, because people need to learn what they do to help them uh, to to help them learn how to marketing themselves. That is an important thing to learn, right? But as a result, it has become a tool which people then use to tell other people what they do, and that's too, too formulaic, 
What I like about Andy's approach is that it is about the person who is listening and feeling for what they need, not thinking about whether you've got your pitch off um, or pitch off so much that you stop listening. And, and that goes back to Ivan's questions as well and, and not having a list of questions in advance. It's engaging and listening and, and really, you know, I, I think I, I often talk about the concept of listening for people rather than listening to people. Take yourself out of the equation. Stop worrying about why they're relevant to you, which is what we tend to do. Or as Stephen Covey says in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, we, we're, we're listening with our answer in mind. Instead of that, just divorce yourself from the conversation and think, well, why are they telling me this? What's their situation? Who do I know who might be relevant to them? And then you, you become much more powerful in that conversation. And then people will really want to know about you. Well, Stanley uh, from Hong Kong, uh, Susan from uh, San Francisco, uh, any closing thoughts on this topic before we wrap up today? Well, I, my one thing that I say in final is every room is full of people. There are 99% of them are really nice people who are there to meet you for the same reason. And it just goes with what Andy said. I took, go everywhere to have fun, be prepared, have a focus. Don't have an agenda because when you have it, it looks like it's burnt into your forehead. And treat people like people. And remember, every room is an opportunity. So always RSVP, say yes, and show up. Stanley, any closing thoughts? Yeah. Uh, my, co my coaching comment is always be interested in other people. Um, forget your um, agenda because uh, I miss so many people you never can even. They are only interested in themselves. They are not interested in your what you do. Uh, they are not in interested in receiving your name cards. They just are interested in passing out theirs or uh, collecting others. So I think one way uh, that could uh, make you stand out is be interested in others. So ask them you know, some uh, good questions and uh, listen to them and find out more about them and you will be very popular in this uh, networking events. Excellent. Thank you, Stanley. Well, I think that's uh, all we have time for today in this edition of the Global Networking Show, and it truly is a global show. Uh, I'm uh, doing the show today from Austin, Texas. Uh, Andy's in the UK, Susan in San Francisco, uh, and Stanley in, in Hong Kong. And I want to thank both Susan and Stanley for joining Andy and I. Uh, thanks also to Inga for your help uh, and your questions. Uh, and Inga, where are you calling from today? Where are you UK, at? London. UK as well. Yes. Uh, keep a look out on our Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus pages, as well as globalnetworkingshow.com for details of next month's show. I can tell you a little bit uh, in advance, next month's show is all about uh, how your networking skills can actually make you a healthier person. And, uh, you know, I, I first read that in a book written by a, a friend of mine, Dr. Wayne Baker, where he said, good networkers are healthier, and I thought he was insane, but um, I now am a true believer, and that's what we're going to be talking about next month. Andy, over to you. Well, in the meantime, don't forget you can revisit this discussion on Google+, on YouTube, uh, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. That'll be going on to iTunes in the next couple of days, hopefully tomorrow. And, of course, as Ivan just mentioned, the website, globalnetworkingshow.com. All of the shows are there, and we also have some resources from our guests. Uh, we hope to see you in the next show. Uh, have a healthy month until then. Uh, have a great rest of the week and weekend ahead. And we'll see you next time out. Thank you very much for joining the Global Networking Show. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.